This is the Sleeper Hold Podcast. Welcome to the Sleeper Hold Podcast, where there are no disqualification on the topics and falls count anywhere. I am your host, Priest, and today we are continuing the Behind the Curtain series as we talk a little bit about promos. But before we get to that, I want to talk a little bit about this past weekend. We had a double pay-per-view weekend. Saturday was NXT TakeOver in Brooklyn. By far, excellent show. Some of the things I was just anywhere about because I really didn't follow those people that much, like the tag team division. But seeing Bailey, one of my favorite, just kick butt and actually make it, heck yeah. All power to you, Bailey. I'm happy to see that you're now the women's champion. Finn Balor defended his title. De- definitely was a great match. But, you know, I still think the match of the night has to go to Bailey beating Sasha Banks. And yes, you can bank on that. Har har. Also, you know, Sunday we had SummerSlam. SummerSlam was a hit and miss for me. There were some good matches, and there were some matches that just really didn't do much for me. I feel the Rollins and Cena match was incredible up to the end. It really kind of just didn't do anything for me to have Jon Stewart get involved in everything else. There was no storyline definition of that. It was just like a quick screw job, curveball type thing. So it really didn't do much for me. Besides that, though, those guys laid everything out. It was an excellent, excellent match. So hats off to Cena. Hats off to Rollins. Rollins actually proved himself a lot to me in that match. Also, really cool new-looking attire. The white and gold looks a lot better on him than the black did. Taker versus Lesnar. That was a pretty good match, too. Don't get me wrong. Um... Could have had a little bit better spots and everything else, but I do like how it ended. It kind of leaves a big controversy, and justifiably, you can and can't say that both men won or both men lost. And I think that's the best way to leave it, because really, it was a must-win situation for both of them. The New Day is now the Tag Team Champions, and, well, now we have to listen to Xavier Woods ramble on and on and on yet again. Kind of sucks. Big Show almost won the IC Championship, but then he lost it, and Ryback retained the title. I'm okay with that, although I've always been a fan of the Big Show, um, so if he would have won it, I would have been okay with that too. Divas Revolution, we saw that Team PCB is the dominant team right now, which is great. They're my girls. I'm all about them. The only thing that kind of stinks is that they keep talking about Nikki's title reign, yet she has not actively defended the title in so long. Yes, I know, they're just trying to do this to break AJ Lee's streak. But it's really kind of annoying to try to say that she's breaking the record or she's about to break the record when she hasn't actively defended it. She's worse of a closet champion than Seth Rollins ever was. Now, getting all that out of the way. Tonight, we're going to have a special guest here, one of my good buddies. He is a good friend of mine. He's been even more of a great rival manager of mine. We've been, you know, on opposing sides as managers in the past. He is one who definitely knows a thing or two about promos, as well as just the business and the mechanics of wrestling as well. And if you've never met this guy or never heard of this guy and you live around the central Illinois area, what are you doing? Find out about this guy. Talk to him. Get to learn from him. He knows a lot about the business, and he's just a great guy. He will help you excel if you ask him for tips, if you give him that respect and show him that you have the desire to better yourself and be awesome. The man I'm talking about is none other than Donovan Taylor. And before we get to that, I just want you guys to know this. This is a special episode about promos on Behind the Curtain. I'm going to have a little fun with this and do something that's kind of outside the norm for almost any podcast. This podcast is not going to be edited. I'm not going to sit there and tweak out if I mess up or Donovan messes up and trips over our words. I'm not going to tweak it out if we curse, even though I'm going to try to make sure we don't. 
So if you find out that this episode is on iTunes and it's got explicit content, well, that's because I decided not to cut anything out. I want to make this one very unique because when it comes to a promo, sometimes one shot is all you get. All right, so we're chilling out here over at Starbucks and I have with me Donovan Taylor. Donovan, thank you for joining us on this one. You're welcome. And let's go ahead and get started by a little bit talking about you, Donovan Taylor. I've seen you manage so many different names, and I kind of want to first off get to, how did you come into this business? What made you start? Well, like anyone else, a lifelong time of wrestling, old-time wrestling. Classics. Well, the problem with classics are, like today, you look at these boy bands, One Direction, you look at, in 10 years, who cares? Yeah. Well, you look at these classic movies or classic rock bands, Led Zeppelin, The Doors, The Beatles, they still sell. The problem with wrestling is the classic of wrestling still would make money today, but people don't want to go that way with the psychology. Their idea of, uh, of selling is, oh, you worked on my arm. I'll pretend you hurt my arm. And it's like that's a bunch of gymnastic flip monkeys, and that's not psychology. That's not. I grew up in wrestling when you, they, made, they played you like a fiddle. Oh, yeah. You cared about the matches. You cared about the ending. These guys were larger than life. And you truly told the story. You didn't just go out there and do something and it wasn't that impressive. You told the story to keep the fans tied to it. Well, no, the story, the story was the wrestlers themselves. And it made it important. Like the best quote, how wrestling used to be, which came from Johnny Valentine. If you went to the dressing room, he would grab you by the throat and throw you into the lockers. And he said... Now let me tell you something. I can't convince you that this sport is real, but I can't convince you I am real. I like he did that. that to you, the wrestlers, everyone. I and like that. That's actually really good. I'm I'm going to make sure I keep that in mind. Because that's how I approach it is that I'm out there. It's real. The fans are paying money. It's wrestling. Too many times what you see in the ring is how do I talk with Brent, my friend Brent on his Facebook bowl wrestling is like, today's wrestling is a bunch of gymnastics, spot monkey spots. They ignore the fans who are paying to see them do the gymnastic spots and they get no reaction from the fans. They don't connect to the fans. When they speak, it's like a third high school skit. And that's why I'm, I came from that generation of, to me, old school is pre-WrestleMania. Yeah. Because when WrestleMania happened, that's when the new school, the cartoon characters came in. But before it was hardcore, KFAB solid, you did not play games. And, and you know, the territory days, and mm-hmm. I personally, I grew up with the Golden Age, and I saw, to me, Golden Age was magic, it was wonderful, but then it went to the Attitude Area and all that, and that's when you start to see the, the negative change. It wasn't always bad, but you mm-hmm. saw the downward spiral go from there. Well, some of the na- things in Attitude Area went too far. But basically, they had that old school mentality of attitude because you cared when Austin met The Rock or Mick Foley met Triple H. You cared about the endings because they were themselves. They went out there. It was the character. There was not the characters, but the wrestler, Steve, the man, Stone Cold, fighting such and such. You cared about the matches. You cared because back then they went for the brass ring. You cared about Mick Foley. That's why when people... And he said, he's going to win the world title on WCW. Everyone turned the channel to watch him win it because they cared about the person. The big key in wrestling these guys don't understand is today, and I hope I'm not hijacking your show in a different oh, direction, no, no, go ahead. is that they think if I do a triple somersault flip through the table, people are going to cheer. Everyone can do gymnastics. This is not stunt man. But if you make them care about who you are, they're going to care about what you do. If you make them care about you as the person in that ring, then they're, and you're believable, people are going to care about the matches and what happens to you and whatnot. And that's what's missing in wrestling. That's where you have the true legends and why they are respectively legends like Dusty Rhodes and whatnot, because you grew to care and love for them. Right. And going back to a little bit about your history and career, I remember the first time I met you was back in the days of 3CW. Awesome promotion. It was a great one, and... I, I remember you were on a rival promotion trying to take over 3CW. I can't remember the name of it. It was AWF. AWF Basically, right. the whole thing was that the guys in 3CW, and regardless of what some people said, and they proved themselves 
and they kick butt was they um, a lot of people go to promotions like New Midwest did not do good at all at the end they were pretty nasty and dirty because I understand I was getting a lot more heat than some of the wrestlers they couldn't take it but so a lot of people would come to 3CW from New Midwest and they were using 3CW to grind an axe against New Midwest I came over I didn't do that. I came over because I knew Tony. I knew the wrestlers. I believed in their potential. I was there to do my best for that particular company. The AWF was was this very anti-hardcore stance I took because I believe those guys were very, very talented. But to me, they were going beneath themselves playing with hardcore matches and whatnot. And the first time I went out there, I thought I was being played a rib. They said, okay, here's what you do since you don't like hardcore. You, in the battle royal, you're going to go out there and tell these guys, no weapons in this battle royal, you're going to remove all the weapons. And the ring and the microphone was on the other side of the ring, so I passed the ring to the wall to make that announcement. Well, none of the wrestlers knew what was going on. And they looked at me like they were going to jump out of the ring, every single one of them, and kick my <laughs> behind. I almost didn't make it out of their life. In fact, I was... I, my, my position was I was so hardcore and against what they were doing in hardcore, but they loved their promotions. So when I would go up there and say, 3CW is garbage because you guys knew much better, I can go out. At, and you were there. I yeah. cannot go out when the matches were over with because the fans and the wrestlers were going to kill me. Yeah, the second anybody saw you, they wanted to lynch you, whether it was the fan, the wrestlers, or whatever. In prime example, those guys in 3CW, None of them wanted to ever do a promo. They wouldn't cut a promo. You could have put a mic in front of them. They froze. I came in one of my matches. I said, 3CW is going down. AWF rules. 3CW is a bunch of garbage and needs to be done away with. Spontaneous. And I believe in spontaneity. I will not, I don't like plants in the audience. Crap. I want people to have a real genuine reaction to what I do. That's what wrestling is all about. The wrestlers started getting on the microphone. This company means a lot to me. I had no one in my life. I was an outcast. I found this company. This company means everything to me. Everyone's applauding them. And I was in back going, oh, crap, I can't go out for sure now. <laughs> They're going to lynch me. But that's the kind of reaction you have when you work with these fans. Some guys come out there. New Midwest, when the first shows before I joined the company, they had this manager came out. He came out with an autograph book, signed. manager ripped it up. Kid sat back down his mom smiling. Because there were supposed to be talent scouts in the audience. Well, if I saw that, I wouldn't book you either, Harry, because, dude, that was a plan. The kid's smiling. Wrestling is about real reactions with the audience. Exactly. I go out there, and you see me. Do I? A lot of times I'm lucky enough, because I'm with some good people, I get the reactions because I go out there, I am real with the audience. Yeah, and one of my best things I've ever seen you do for one of your promos is when you walked out, started the show, you said, you know, you're... That wrestling hardcore is a bunch of garbage and you're going to save these fans from this garbage by reading them from a classic novel. And yes. the fans hated it. And it was funny because I was just new to the business. Yes. I was just learning about how to be a manager let alone doing some wrestling training that I actually sat back and took notes from you and Pat McGroin and that's what really helped inspire me on going more towards the management side because you guys really just took it over. When I handed it to Ricky, they started booing. Then he handed it to Phil Roberts. And Phil, if you don't understand, on the smartphone, he's this real skinny kid, weighs about great guy. In fact, his promos were so horrible, they were great. People were on their feet, they were screaming, they were shouting, they were throwing stuff at him. He was so bad at promos, he was the best at him because he was Edward Good. Then what started, so when we did this thing where I handed it to Ricky, Nelson, he came out two valets in each arm, with the U. Hefner robe, smoking a little uh, pipe, you know. It was, and he started reading. It was great. Where that came from was Andy Kaufman was a big wrestling fan. Oh yes, I love Andy. Andy Kaufman, at some of his comedy shows, you'd pay money to go see him. You sit down, and he would read you nothing but the Great Gatsby the entire show. <laughs> Nash at the time we looked back it's funny at the time I'd be probably ticked off if oh, I was yeah. in the audience so that's where it came from Andy Coffin who knew wrestling psychology like no one did I took a page out of his book and said you know what instead of having a hardcore match 
We're going to have read from The Great Gatsby to teach you people class. This is a book. It has words. You need to be educated fans on what culture really is. And they were ticked. Or some things we do was spontaneous. Like, we were there. I don't know if you were in the car. It was a hot, hot day. They opened up the garage doors in the warehouse we were in, the big door. People uh-huh. were applauding them. I'm sitting back there going, you know, they are losing air conditioning with that door being open. So I went down there, and I shut the door on them. I remember that. This one girl walked along with tattoos, flip-flops. I said, get out of the way, moo-moo. And, oh, they were hot. <laughs> I was saying, you guys are full of hot air. That's what's making this building hot. I'm not paying to lose air conditioning because you fans. And, I mean, they were ticked. Then the good guys wrestlers came out, opened the vent door. People started applauding him. And this is where spontaneous comes from. As I'm walking out, the fans broke into a spontaneous chant of na 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 na, hey hey, goodbye, na 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 na. All of them, spontaneous. I go in the back when the Irish Revolution guys was back there behind the curtain. He looks to me with these big saucer eyes going, Donovan, we need to get you your own security. You've got some liquid heat going on. They're going to kill you. <laughs> And that's, you've always been a great heel manager. I mean, I, I don't think I've ever seen a time where I've seen you actually go face with a face team. Actually, I did one time. Actually, not a face team. I was actually at um, in Kincaid. Derek Moss is fighting Stephen Bishop, and I was the commissioner for the night. Bishop and his manager gets out there. We're not going to defend our title. These are the rules. Boo. I come out. Really? I'm from Chicago. Things are happening. The rules are you're defending your title. Everyone started cheering and cheering. And then Derek came out. They cheered him even more. And had some situations like that. Then Tim will say, you were sitting our heat. You got cheered. Then the entire card, him and everyone in the main event, were sitting down on the stage watching the entire card together. Part of a promo is you got to back up the promo. Oh, yeah. If I'm having, if, my, if I'm Matthew, Matthew Scott and he's fighting say uh, Robbie McCann yeah and they had this big promo they have a pull apart opening promo and the entire car they're sitting side by side on the bleachers watching the card is that going to destroy it's not going to be believable is that going to lose their heat oh yeah and how many times have you seen that in wrestling too many a lot of independent these guys will sit together side by side after the show see you next month I want to kick your butt oh hey man that was a good match yeah it was a good match thank you and it's like they don't know. That's what kills their heat. They're not believable. When you do a promo and you see fans, a magician, you can say, well, maybe it's fake, maybe it's not fake, but they don't load the rabbit in front of their hat and show you how it's done. Exactly. They have enough respect for their art form or what they're doing. Penn and Teller, one time they did something wrestlers could learn from how they do it. They did a skit where they had a Penn, little short dude, I think Penn and July or whatever, Teller was going behind the curtain. It's his silhouette. He was walking, he took off his hat, put it back on, pulled out a pack of cigarettes, put them in his mouth, lit it up, smoked it, came out of the curtain. Gillette goes, y'all thought that he went through and he was taking off his hat, smoking a cigarette. No, he didn't. They hadn't written in front of the curtain. He was doing all the slot of hand stuff. And you go, oh, that's how he did it. Now let's put it back behind the curtain and let him see how it's done. You're watching, you're thinking, oh, that's nonsense. He's just pulling off his head, taking out a cigarette and smoking. He's not doing none of that stuff. Key wrestling, like I said with Johnny Valentine. People think it's fake. You just got to show them that it's not fake. Yeah. And what they're seeing is for real. And that's, like you see with promos and talking and carrying yourself on, that's how you do it. That's that's the big thing about a lot of this. Is there's a lot of magic and there's a lot of things that you have to carry yourself and make it believable. And that's kind of what I want to get to with the whole promo. So before we get too far, let's actually right. get to the meat and potatoes. Of All right. The promo. I'm kind of jumping your subjects. So you have to excuse me oh, on hey, that. That's what you're here for. You're my you're my guest here. We want to have fun with this. All right. All right. So promo. In a lump sum, for anybody who's new to the wrestling world, let's just go ahead and give them a brief explanation of what a promo is in our mindset. Okay, here's basically what a promo is. That's when you get on the microphone. If you're, if it's a TV show or, or like it's for next month, your promo is to get a fan to leave his nice, comfortable home, drive a big di- a distance, to pay money, to sit next to a bunch of people they don't like, 
to watch a show that they have to see. A promo makes fans want to come and have a reason to care about the match. Exactly. And one thing I always tell people when it comes to wrestling is, I always tell people wrestling is a story. But promo is what fills the gaps. You can have a match after match after match, but sometimes you won't have things connect the dots. That's what the promo does. The promo connects the dots and leaves you the anticipation for what's to come. But it has to be believable. Some oh, guys yeah. think doing a promo is, okay, here's a camera, we're in the locker room, this guy comes out, and hey, how's it going? Oh, we have a problem with so-and-so. We do? Here, let me get on the phone and talk to someone. Oh, it's settled. It's fixed. And someone said, that's a perfect promo. Hey, you're, why don't you do it in front of the fans? That's what a promo is. I'm talking to you, but we're addressing the fans out there. Exactly. That's a promo. That kind of promo is like, it's a stupid skit. Like, I call it, let's ignore that the camera is there. I'm sorry. I'm, this is in Hollywood. If I see a camera there, I'm addressing the camera. Yeah. The fans are there at the camera. I'm not going to ignore them in the ring and say, you. It's like, if you notice, what's the secret I do when it comes to, when, I, when someone does a promo, what's the effect of promos? When Dusty Rose did his promo, by dying bikinis and queens, and or Ole Anderson talking, to, they addressed the fans You've got while to they were talking. To those fans, they are your target. If you don't address the fans, what's the point of being there? The, they, you are there for them just as much as they are there for you. The fans are the entire show. Yes, you're there to entertain them. You think. I'm hot, I can do this and that. The fans will give, get bored. You have to give them a reason to care. Today, no one wants to sell. All the good guys are this invincible hero. All the hills are cool. Me, I'm a jerk as a hill. I'm a disgraceful, disgusting, That's why nasty. I love having you around. You're, you play the ultimate jerk, and it's great. You're supposed to. Like some guy said on an interview about this guy in WWE, well, he's being a jerk. He's not a heel at all. Dude, that's what heels do. We're not nice guys. I'm there to make you hate me. You cannot have a good hero without a villain. And the hero faces out there, you're supposed to be beaten down. Yeah. The whole purpose of you is to go out there and overcome the heel adversity. If you come and beat the heel all the time, you're Superman. And after a while, it gets boring. Or if you get a pile driver through a table, you pop back up, you are a cartoon character. Do you cry when Wally Coyote gets hit by Bugs but by Roadrunner? Oh yeah, he's my guy. I mean, I mean, bro, if Wally Coyote gets hit by an anvil, you're not crying. It's like, oh, he got hit by another anvil. Yeah. If you're a wrestler and someone hits you with the chair, they pop back up. You're a cartoon character. If someone hits you with the chair and they cart you out into an ambulance and you're bleeding and you're, you're hurt. Sitting, you're sitting there almost wondering if it's actually legit. You're going, oh my gosh, is he going to be okay? Exactly. That's the secret of wrestling. Too much of it's cartoonish where. I get so I got three pile drivers. I just jump back up. Yeah, it's it's gotten pretty bad on that. And, it's and the thing that, like you and I were saying, the thing that makes this promo successful and great, just like anything else in the business, is making it believable. And I firmly believe and backing it up. Yeah, and I firmly believe that you have to believe in it yourself. You can't just sit there and go, "Oh, I don't like you. I'm going to beat you up." But you have to you have to get in that mindset. Of, I really hate your guts. And I want to see you just bury six feet under, and I'm gonna do everything I can. Or like for you and I as a manager, you have to believe that your man is the best. And I always do. And to give you an example, like with the promos believable, I was doing it in, in um, I guess October in Mount Plasky, I'm with Rick Skills Company again. And we did a promo with a couple guys. He came in with his girlfriend. They're near the business. And, you know, of course, I'm out there. I'm for real. And they go, how should we react? Well, react like you would on the street. If I call you a teletubby and I just called her a skank, what would you do? What would you think? Yeah. That's how you react. If I'm out there and I'm calling you that, you don't walk by me during a match and say, oh, you you would shit to take every shot you can because I just called you a dirty name. You should be wanting to kick my teeth in for what I said. Exactly. You know, that's that's the one thing that I, it took me a while to learn, I'll be honest, is make it where I can make people truly believe that I believe what I'm saying. Like, when I first started, it wasn't as priest. And my promos, my skit was terrible. I tried to play too dark, too sadistic, and not genuine. And then I found my niche as priest. Now, like, if I'm managing Coleco or 
one day hopefully beast, I will make those fans be able to believe that I am guaranteeing that these guys are the next champion. They're the next ones to demolish everybody and be number one. And the thing is, like as a manager, not going to another side rabbit. I'm 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 a rabbit hunter. I'm bad at going down rabbit oh, hey, trails. You're fine. <laughs> is as a manager, your job is to lift up the guys you're with. Now, some of these guys, I've worked with guys who are awesome, like Robbie Beam, Robbie McCann. We are we get together, and I think me and, and the beast Matt Scott, he's a beast himself. Is um, we go out there, we do it for real. We get the reactions because oh, I just lost my train of thought. Duff, bad thing on a microphone. <laughs> it, you're talking about how you know going through that rabbit hole about talking about being believable and everything else, and you and Robbie were a good team for that. Well, because we went out there, and it's kind of like well, some of our promos. Like we started to ride at the Redneck Festival. Because we got out there, and of course, Kat was talking, and she's saying, I want to thank all the sponsors of the Redneck Festival for having us in for this car. And I grabbed the mic, and I said, are those the sponsors of this event, or is it the cast reunion of Deliverance? <laughs> then I went on, like I said, I'm from Chicago, the real estate capital. Where we come from, the women don't have Adam's apples like down here. Oh, we we started a riot at the first match. They were chasing us back. That is insane. One of the ladies was yelling at me, going, "I don't have an Adam's apple. I got four kids." Redneck Festival. I said, "Yeah, you got four kids. One by your grandpa, one by your brother, one by your uncle, one by your dad." She and her friends like came over the railing to kick my behind. I can believe it. <laughs> and I'm walking back, and Robbie's stopping in front of him doing a chicken strip. Now, if any of you guys don't know Robbie McCann, he's a short guy with a lot of tattoos. He grew up in the ghetto, worst ghetto of East Peoria. He's been in a few fights. This is a man you don't want to mess with. When he does something, we do it. We play for real. We don't go out there. We don't pretend. We work hard at what we do. Robbie is a very legit person, referee or wrestler. He's tough. He's one of the best guys I've ever managed. Oh, yeah. Me and Nick, Matt Scott is another one. He's a class act. But inside the ring, he's somebody's, he's going places. Oh, yeah. And, and, you know, again, even with... I've seen Robbie do these promos before where he pushes that edge. He pushes that envelope, but he makes it where you truly believe every word he says. Because you know he believes every word he says. You have to. And it's also when you do promos, some mistakes people make is... I'll say a lot of things about the town, like Mount Plasky not having running water, and all they have is outhouses, and they all bathe in them. And, and actually, I'm not lying. I'm telling the truth. That Mount Plasky is a really stinky town, and the people really need to learn how to use toilet paper. And I mean, it's really a horrible town. It's disgusting. Yeah, but I could also say that you're nothing but a fan of Chicago, so... Yeah. I guess you're okay to some extent. <laughs> I'm a St. Louis guy, what can I say? <laughs> yeah, oh, St. Louis, yeah. But it's um, just believable. But when you see things like that, but if one thing people you don't want to start saying is people go to wrestling to escape reality. Oh, yes. And I always say one guy got upset because some woman slapped him at ringside. What did you say to her? I called her fat. I said, dude, you deserved it. Yeah. Don't give me this thing. If you go to, well, I'll tell you this, any guy listen to this, if you're a manager or you're a wrestler, and you go to win ringside and say, you're fat, and she slugs you, don't expect me to come to your aid. You deserved it. You're a moron. <laughs> you don't say that stuff. You come up to an African-American person and say a racial slur, the old days you might have gotten away with it, but they come up and kick, especially in today's climate, and they knock oh, you yeah. out. Hey, you have it coming. You're a moron for saying <laughs> oh, it. Oh, yeah. You know? Nowadays, it's dangerous to do all that. Yeah. Um, going on with some of the promos, one thing I want to definitely talk about are some of the best promos throughout the years. So I'm talking anywhere from before the golden age of WWF, to today, whatever. Um, you know, one person that I know has always been great at their promos is Ric Flair and also Dusty Rhodes. Exactly. Those two, you listen to any of their promos, now even if you don't know who they are, you're going to know who they are and you're going to believe every word they say. The best promo I've ever heard was Ole Anderson kicking Sting out of the horseman. If you get a chance on YouTube for it and he speaks, it's believable. It's oh, yeah. real. You're going, oh my goodness, it's over for Stinger. No more horsemen for you. You cross the line, buddy, and you believe every word he said. Now, if afterwards the Sting and Ole Anderson were sitting in the bleachers together, what would it have done to the promo? 
it would probably be nothing. Hint for wrestlers out there today. Remember that lesson. If you saw your promo, would you want to go see you? If you gave an awesome promo, but they saw you and your opponent hanging out together at the arena and in front of the fans, would you want to see you wrestle a main event? Nope. That's the secret. Be believable. Selling is not, oh, he stomped on my hand, I'll pretend my hand's hurt. That's common sense. That's not selling. Selling is selling the believability of the story, what you're going through, not acting. I see people come up and go, wake up, wake It's like a third grade old yeller skit. Yeah. Seriously? This is horrible, you know? You have to make it believable before, during, and after. Not just during the match, or not just with the promo before the match, but even after. When If you got your arm beat up, you better be holding that arm even after. And if the fans are like, hey, I want to see your autograph, you say, hey, my right arm is hurt. I can't write right, right. now. But see, they don't care if it's hurt unless they care about who you are. Yeah. Like Donovan, if someone walks up even says one word to me or slaps my suspenders, what happens? The oh, place yeah. just roars yeah. because you developed a character that they, they love calling me Mr. Wilson. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> and they torment me. I can't, last card I was at, some fan bought a Dennis the Menace DVD to hold up to me during the match. Like, here, Mr. Wilson. <laughs> Oh, I wish I would have been there for that. That's great. But, I mean, like I was saying, with some of the best promos throughout the years, the reason why I bring up Flair and um, Dusty Rhodes is because they are very opposite when it comes to their characters. Original. They were their own characters. They weren't scripted. Yeah. They didn't try to ape anyone else. And that's the problem. A lot of these guys who do promos, like one guy was was being playing commissioner. I'll spare him his name. I gave him. He came up and was like, next month we're going to have a match. We're going to do this. I got a microphone and say, dude, you need X lax. I call it the Macho Man I'm Constipated <laughs> promo. Brother! Or, or Hulk Hogan Macho Man promo. Brother! Next month, we're going to do this. And I'm going to do the toughest guy. And I'm like, dude, take some X lax, will you? You're constipated. <laughs> <laughs> they did, you have those kind of promos. But yeah. like Ole Anderson, you look at his promos, they were original. You look at Dusty Rhodes, Junkyard Dog. Roddy Roddy Piper. Oh, Piper. He was oh, like he was incredible. He was not like anyone else. And all these guys who were out there who want to try to be like this person or that person, you'll always be second rate. I mean, we're always influenced by people and always it's part of our DNA. That's how we adapt, that's how we become. But at the same time, be original. Be with your characters. Don't try to do what the WWE does because you'll be second rate. Yeah. That was that was my problem when I first started. Is I tried to be the dark manager. I tried to be kind of in the same rank as a Paul Bear, but darker like the Taker, and it just didn't work. But right. when I found my own originality of, this is who I am when I don't censor exactly. myself. I found out a lot great. of managers were wearing these white shirts and red suspenders. I came up with it years ago. because I, <laughs> I was like, well, I didn't think of him. I thought I was drive through. I was managing him, and in every restaurant you have these uh, this older manager who dresses fancy with the fancy car. You think he's God's gift to women and all the young <laughs> girls there, yet he still lives at home with mommy, you know, and that's all he's going to be is fast food. And that, that's what I designed. That's what he, that, I, the drive through came, then he came, that character then became P.M. Sanders really into his own mm-hmm. as Donovan Taylor, the next evolution. That's incredible. And but now I'm finding, so okay, I'm going to have to give myself a darker colored shirt so I'm not looking like everyone else. If everyone has a theme song, I don't want a theme song. Yeah. And 3CW, I didn't want one because I just came out, people were booing, people booed. And not like that, I don't need music, just let me come out, they'll boo me to no end. And that's oh, yeah. my music. Exactly. Be different, be original. It sounds like one thing I talked about in the last episode was like the music and all that. You know, I talked about how it's a part of your entrance. You something like you said, you don't always need it, but you got to be careful how you do. It. You got to do stuff that's uniquely you, because anybody will come out with the next big hit on the radio or whatever, and it's not original. Just like with your gimmick, you know. Going back to our classics, Piper was original, Rhodes was original, Flair was original, Anderson was original. Why were they original? Because it was a part of who they truly were put into this great persona that they could truly connect with. Flair acted and believed he was God's gift to women. You know, styling and profiling, limousine riding, silver spoon fed, and then you had Dusty Rhodes, son of a plumber, 
Mm -hmm. Just humble as can be, but yet he was going to be there for every working man and woman to show them that dreams come true. And with Flair's case, he believed it. And I love Flair, but like promised Flair was, he got to the point he was Rick Flair even today, 24 hours, seven days a week. I remember when they had celebrity wife swap, and it was Piper's wife, who actually was in Flair's first wedding. Mm -hmm. And she swapped wives with Flair's current wife. And she tried to help Flair to get be not Rick Flair 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that's sometimes you can't buy into the myth of, wow, you can give a promo and make it believe, but sometimes you got to remember who you are at heart and not get into, oh, if people used to accuse me of, like, you take your character too seriously. And, what, and I said, no, you're the ones who have your character's initials on your license plates. Yeah. I take what I do seriously. My character, what I do, I'm a goofball. I make friends, but I do take this business seriously that I want. When I go out there, there's only five fans, I and I wrestle in front of 11 fans, and that was no fun. But you give them everything you got because you hope they come back and bring more friends with them exactly. and more friends and more friends. And, and, you know, that's the thing is there are a lot of people, not just in the professional world, but even in the independent circuit that you and I both know, who is like they don't know how to turn off the switch. Mm -hmm. They are their character almost 24-7, it looks like. Mm -hmm. It's very rare to see them turn off that switch. Mm -hmm. And it's almost scary sometimes because you kind of wonder for their own health and safety, is that wise? Mm -hmm. But in the promo thing, one thing that I've noticed, especially watching a lot of the old footage and even some of the stuff nowadays, it's common that you'll catch on to certain catchphrases. You know, Macho Man had the ooh, yeah, Flair had the woo. Even today, we have Paul Heyman who starts off everything with ladies and gentlemen, and he introduces himself properly. It's one of those things, it almost seems like a promo, in order to make yourself recognized, you have to have that one key element. And I'm not saying it has to be catchphrases, but those help you. Mm -hmm. But like you did, you walked out unannounced. And usually at the same time, you told everybody right away, shut up, I am talking, you need to learn something. Mm -hmm. you, you kind of made them understand that you're superior intellectually than they are. I never got into a lot of catchphrases, because I just spoke from the heart and how I really felt at the time. Nothing wrong with catchphrases. Like, Paul Heyman is a genius. He's probably oh, yeah. him and Jim Cornette. When it comes to Mike Mender, two of the best. But he, he, he was talking with some of you. If you want to learn about wrestling, get the podcast also, not only of yours, but Jim Ross's and, oh, yeah. and Chris Jericho's and Steve Austin's. He comes out there and it's like he introduces himself. You know right away who he is, who he represents. The guys are great. That's, that's one of those people that, you know, mm -hmm. if I ever had some lucky way of making this thing explode and meeting those guys or even having like a. Skype phone call interview with those guys. Oh, you better think I'm going to take advantage of it because those guys are amazing. But who's Jim Cornette like? No one else. Yeah. Who's Paul James like? No one else. Who is Sissy Rose like? No one else. But these guys, oh, they're just like this guy. They're just like that guy. You can find the connection. But with those guys, they're so authentic. And that's what's so great. And, and one thing I love is in Paul Heyman's podcast when he was uh, at the uh, Stone Cold podcast with Paul Heyman as a guest, he mentioned about his first promo attempt and something that Dusty Rhodes told him that I take to heart as somebody who cuts promos, who manages, and now does this podcast. He, Dusty Rhodes asked him one simple thing. Where's the money? You have to sell. Exactly. When I'm out there, I'm not selling myself and where we people think. I'm trying to sell the people I am with. I'm out there. I'm trying. Now, peek behind the curtain. I'm not only there to get myself food, but most I'm supposed to get my guy the crowd either for him or against him or for or against his opponent at the same time. Exactly. I'm there. Everyone's there work. But some of these guys who don't work the audience, I can go out there. I can get no response from the fans from them because they're not giving the fans anything back. Yeah. They don't know how to work the fans. Working the crowd is a very important thing for a promo. It's the only it's, important thing in wrestling is working the fans. Yeah. When you're doing a promo, if you're not getting any reaction, why are you there? Exactly. If, if, if it's not working for you in one way, it's time to find a new direction. That's like, best example of that. When Rock started, when he was Rocky Maivia, mm -hmm. he wasn't getting much reaction. People only really got reaction out of him because, oh, he's a Samoan, they know his dad, everything else. Mm -hmm. But when he actually truly became The Rock and learned how to use that mic like magic, fans ate him up. Even when he turned heel. It took him a while to go from loving him as a heel to, hey, he's being a real jerk. We don't like him anymore. 
I mean, he really knew how to work them over and find a way to adapt at all times. You them. have to listen to the fans. I just guess I have a match. Day. We had a great match. I'm going, they sat down the entire time. They were bored because every wrestler wrestles the same way. When you see Blackjack Mulligan, he wrestled uniquely as Blackjack Mulligan. Dusty Rhodes, only Dusty Rhodes could wrestle as Dusty Rhodes. Rick Flair has a lot of imitators. He imitated the great Betty Rogers with his own spin. They were unique in what they did. When they gave a promo, it was a unique promo to their character. But how many times look at the infant wrestlers and all the promos together, how many of them sound just like someone else's promo? Their matches look like someone else's match. There's no individuality, and that's what sells wrestling. Exactly. And, you know, I agree that, you know, we all take a little bit of something from what we've seen and what we've grown up with. I've always teased with my wife that if I magically somehow was able to get back to training in the ring without my knees killing me, yeah, I'd, I'd become more of a tactical wrestler like Bret Hart mixed with a little bit of Edge. They're my two favorite wrestlers that I grew up with. You know, I've always been a fan of the, hit, the Hitman, and Edge's arrogance was always something that I loved. Those would be my guys, but I can't just do that because then people are going to go, oh, he's just a copycat. You've got to have that unique X factor that's your own. Well, you just take what you can and put your own spin to it where it becomes unique to you. Now, there's a lot of good independent wrestlers out there who are like Brendan Espinosa, Brent Brooks, Matt Scott is a very unique character, Robbie McCann. And some of the promotions out there, wrestling is, there's some strong promotions out there. The, the guys there, some of the guys who wrestle can learn. Like, Joey Grunge has a great promotion. He's got some great talented guys who know how to work the audience. And they're a growing company. The best community, I think, is in St. Louis, her, ran by Herb Simmons and Ray Matisic. I was visiting the car, old school crowd, old school audience. They react very well. And you said, if anyone runs a promotion and wants to learn how to do it successfully, Herb Simmons be one of the guys to talk to you. Watch what Joey Grunge does. PWA has actually caught a win. Probably thinks the one guy joined the company was a game changer for him and added the, what they needed was a, is one of the rec- was uh, Timothy Givens. He has really helped them. And he was just a missing piece in the already good puzzle. Now mm-hmm. they're going all over they're the place. They're exploding. And, it's, and in order to keep a company exploding, you have to not ignore the fans. Oh, yeah. You have to work the fans. You have to make them care about your unique character. You have to wrestle uniquely. You have to talk uniquely. You have to connect with them. You have to know what the fans are wanting and be able to uh, be willing to adapt and evolve to it, but still keep you true to yourself. And that's where, you know, as much as I bash about the Attitude Era becoming the, the end of the magic for the WWE. It wasn't truly the true beginning of the end. It was just where you could see things slowly starting to go to where we got to the PG era and everything else that I absolutely felt like fell apart. But they made the Attitude Era because they had to adapt. If they were going to survive against WCW, they had to adapt. But they still kept it to where you're like, hey, I want to watch WWE because they're going to have... The Undertaker in a Hell in a Cell match, where they're going to have D Generation X do something crazy and stupid. They knew how to keep true to themselves while still adapting to please the fans. And you got to do that with your promos, you got to do that with your character, you got to do that with everything. And like I said, with, in my opinion, with the promos, it's just that's such another way of connecting to the fans without having to, oh, hey, we're just going to have a big old brawl, beat each other down. Because sometimes the fans aren't going to get into that unless they know why. Now, that's what promo helps out with. When I saw the, the, the promo where you had to pull apart between Undertaker and Lesnar, that was beautifully done oh, to set the man. man. That's how it should be done. That was explosive. But I seen one thing that it was like with the Divas or something where they kidnap some Diva, lights go on, there's a box inside the ring, she's inside the box. I'm going, I didn't like that. To me, that was just so fake. It was not believable. Yeah. Keep it real. Anything you do, if you keep it real, the fans will respond. And, and like you just said, with Brock and Taker, they have done by far probably one of the best spots recently. I mean, again, a lot of credit to Paul Heyman. I love Paul Heyman as a manager. He does a great job in today's generation. Oh, awesome. But right there, those two exploded to the fact that he had to have the whole roster pull them apart. And you can hear over the camera, Brock Lesnar say, I'm going to kill you. And then Undertaker, without skipping a beat, replies with, you're going to have to. Who, that's genius. And it's one of those things that people nowadays don't think about how they can do that and really get the fans going, 
holy crap, these people really legitimately hate each other. Now, for a promo, did that make you want to watch SummerSlam? Oh, hands down. I knew that. I knew right away that's going to be the main event to watch no matter what. You know, that's what a promo is. It makes you care about the match. Exactly. So, you know, WrestleMania, I didn't like how that match ended with Rollins coming in. Oh, that but was Lesnar, terrible. But when those two got together, it was like animosity. They weren't like, okay, I'm going to go in and have... And the first thing he did after he, he this guy messed me over, I'm going to go in the ring and put him in a lock. No, they saw each other. They went after each other like a fight. And oh, that's yeah. how it should it should have been. They built that feud up great. And I, I love how they phrased it with the Beast was licking his chops when he was in the ring with Rollins. Because exactly how it was being. As you saw, as time progressed, even with him being suspended for a while, Lesnar was just building and boiling and boiling and boiling, just ready to have that pressure release. Now, if he was, he went in the ring against the Undertaker, and they, and the first thing they did was they just lock up. Would that have been believable? No, it would have been too much classic wrestling and not enough true hatred brawl style. See, when they set it up, they hated each other, and they set it up. How many guys today set up a kind of a good feud, and the first thing they do is, oh, let's just lock up, and it's like. No, it's like the heel should always be avoiding it. Lesnar's big enough. She's not going to run from anyone. Yeah. But this wrist wrestling is like you miss over a good guy. Their whole job is to whip the heel, and the heel should be chickening out, cowarding out. You can't touch him. Exactly. You finally get your hands on him. Good guy wins. Yay. Bad guy knocks him out. Oh, except the next month because you got to give one over in the back. You know? Exactly. And that was the thing that I, I loved and hated about this whole thing with Lesnar Undertaker is – it became really hard at first to see where they're, which direction they're going to go because you had a split fan base. You had people cheering for Taker. You had people cheering for Lesnar. And Lesnar had built himself up from going from heel to a face turn because people loved seeing this monster mm-hmm. just demolish everything. They almost loved him, almost Goldberg-like, but better in my opinion. But who cares about direction? It's the ride that counts. Exactly. That's the thing is that... You saw at the very start of that, after they brought out, Lesnar got out and started working on Taker again, and then you got to kind of think of, okay, this is the direction they're going to go. Let's see how it plays out. Same with, you know, Rollins and Cena. Great match. I loved it. The only thing I didn't love was the ending. I, I felt like storyline-wise and building-wise, it made no sense to have Jon Stewart get involved. If it would have been that, you know, Jon Stewart tried to get involved and just scared himself away, and then that chair was used, Maybe. It really did not make sense. So it went from a great story between the two not like each other as mutual champions to what just happened and why to the point where now that the day has passed, I'm going, should I even care anymore? Because it really ruined the great animosity that they had doing that. It, it made me not really care about either title that much right now. My well, problem with wrestling is one of the best books, I'll make a plug, Larry Manstick's written many books on wrestling. One of his books he written was Wrestling at the Chase, talking about how they used to book down and the stories are worth the book alone. The main thing that Muchnick did, and that's why he was such a strong territory, was he kept the championship strong. It was none of, there's so many of these dusty, what they call dusty finishes, where everyone runs in, the reverse title, someone wins, reverse it. Or one guy, this face won the title. After having to feed everyone in the locker room, who came did a run in. Then somebody had to jump in, take out the bad guy for him, so he can win the title. Well, one, who's he got left to beat? Because he's already beaten everyone during the match. Yeah. And two, he had to have help to win the title at the end. So you just made him a very weak. When it should have just been a simple, clean finish. Mm-hmm. If they want to have a rematch, then the Hill should have just attacked him after the match and set up a rematch. Oh, yeah. Simple is sometimes kiss, guys. Keep it simple, stupid. Instead exactly. Of, and fans respond to it better. You know, and I know I, on my uh, blogs and everything else, have made many comments, especially on Twitter, about how I can't stand closet champions. You know, we see it with Nikki Bella. We see it with Seth Rollins in the past. Mm-hmm. I don't like it when a champion doesn't truly defend. I've always been a firm believer of you have the 30-day rule for a reason. Right. You know, that was there in the classic times for a reason. It needs to be honored. 
unless you're a heel like Rollins, and it's perfect because it ticks the fans off that I'm not defending it, no way. So when they do get him to defend it, wow, it's something special. So that's an effect for a heel. He's yeah. being a chill heel champion. I'm not defending this against anyone because you don't, I mean, and, and people it, hate him for exactly. it. It's like I hate it because of what I truly believe in personally, mm-hmm. but it works for the dynamic. It works for the heel. It works for his problem because he can sit there and brag about he, how he is the best. And he has held this title since WrestleMania, blah, 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 and how he's so awesome. And what does it do? It makes you hate him more. That's why people say, he's a jerk. He's not a good heel. Oh, he's a good you? He's a good heel. I didn't like when he won the title. I thought, what a jerk. Because yeah, he interrupted a, a good match. It was a, it was a beautiful match. Until he ripped it off. Because at the time, yeah, Lesnar, was his face was getting, I mean, it was a brutal match. And he jumped, ran down. I'm like... You're kidding me, right? Yeah, that's exactly what happened to me. My jaw dropped like, are you serious? This is almost worse than watching the strength get broken. Or the worst one was when uh, Rio Kazuna won the title and Hogan ran out of nowhere and beat Rio Kazuna for the title. That was, oh yeah. <laughs> I remember that one too. And then he went to Japan to defend it and badmouth the WWE title over there. It's like, yeah, it's wrestling is a weird sport. It is. It, it's, it's a unique as I tell people, it's a creature of its own, and it's a drug as well, because anybody who gets into this business, you get hooked. And, and I would never change it for the world. I would never leave this thing for the world. Oh, I love it. And one thing you throw out good promos, one guy I want to throw out there, one kind of guy used promos I liked a lot, was of the original three godfathers of the WWE, the Grand Wizard. Yes. He was one of the best guys talking it was like a doctor. I like to hear people. He's talking at the end with the Sheikh by Muhammad Ali. When he was talking, like, he's when he came up with the phrase, Sir, you need glasses. You need to see an optometrist because you obviously you need glasses. I mean, guy was brilliant in what he said. Ernie Roth, the Grand Wizard. Yeah, and I mean, there's so many great people who've done the mic. And, and when you think about constant promo, one thing I, I do got to shoot out there is nobody cuts a promo like a commentator and the reason why I said it is because that's all they're meant to do they are guiding you through the story throughout the whole entire show they are doing a constant non-stop promo because they have to help you not only see what's going on but know what's to come so you are still saying hey I'm going to keep this channel tuned right here and not change it to something oh, exactly. else well it's, it's not easy being a commentary I mean on our podcast, Ross and Shivani was talking. It's not easy to do a wrestling commentary. Oh, no. Jim Ross makes it look easy. Shivani, he's kind of underrated, but he was a good commentator. Oh, yeah. Gordon Soli is probably one of the best. They made it look easy, but they were also the straight man to all these crazy characters going on around them. So oh, it's yeah. kind of like they're the grandmaster of this wild circus going around, and they have to be the straight people with all the madness. You and, know, you know I, I've. I've do, done commentating before. I know I'm going to be probably doing it again in the future. And it's one of those things of it's not easy, especially for me, because I'm not a play-by-play type of guy. I'm very calm. Right. And trying to make sure I can call out the play-by-plays, I'm sometimes like, okay, was that a fisherman suplex? Was that a T-bone? And it's like after I watch it again a second time, I'm like, okay, I know what it was. But at the spot, it's like, dang it, I can't get it out of my mouth. <laughs> like what's fancy was said to me was the last show I was at – I don't want to promote because I do it for real. I don't like these storylines. And somebody had this idea for some weird storyline. It was like the, the bread, like I've known before the match. Yeah, this, 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 and this. And then the commentary said, well, this is the story. It's really complicated. But I know whatever you say, you're going to un- out trump me. So what are you going to do? He's like, well, he's, sometimes you get guys like, yeah, for good wrestlers, you can get hijacked. He's like, really? That's Ivanhoe. I can't even keep track of that. I just go out oh, yeah. there and say, my guys are going to beat these guys because they're good at what they do. Yeah, and that's, you know, again, you know, even with me, when it comes to either managing or doing the commentary or anything else, I, I prefer to be colored because then I can truly be myself and say, these are the guys I'm rooting for. These are and the guys who are going to do good. As a manager, you're getting much grief about them saying, like, you do a promo, but well, you sound my hate. You're, you didn't, you're focusing to, t- I mean, give Bobby Heenan even got oh, grief as a manager. Bobby was one of the best. Oh, he is, and very good. I mean, he was funny. He's hilarious. I don't try to be like anyone else, but if I need a reaction like a Bobby Heenan, I'm, I'm happy. There's times I've got, but he could do it consistently. That's why he was the best. He, he made you love to hate him because he did it so intellectually. It wasn't just him running his mouth and then 
like Piper smashing a coconut over your head. It was him actually using his intellect to motivate and persuade you to hating his words, hating his talk, hating his character. Another man who's really good about that with his words, who's very eloquent, is Jake the Snake Roberts. Oh, he's got a brilliant mind for wrestling. His psychology, they say, is second to none. And he's really good at everything he does. He's, he can play people left and right. Hopefully now he's gotten his, I guess, his life together. And, yeah. and he's off of the drugs, which... And when you get wrestling, wrestling does, did not cause a drug addiction. Well, a lot of the pain does. But it just attracts people with that kind of... That's prone to those kind of addictions. Luckily, I've never seen drug abuse in any of the locker rooms. No, I've never seen anyone juiced up or anything. They care too much about their bodies and their health to be doing something that stupid. I've noticed that with a lot of the local people. They care too much about the business, themselves, exactly. their family. They've got a good head on their shoulders. They, now, I've seen some people before in other promotions, not going to name any names, but you go like, hey, I'm going to get bladed tonight, so I'm going to have a little something to drink. And it's like, no, that's just going to make you gush out more, and that's not safe for you. But those are so few and far between, mm-hmm. I can't believe that that's what really happens behind the closed doors see, all the time. my matches, I don't see anybody ever get bladed in my matches, though. The wildest match is when um, I was managing uh, Adam against Dickie Williams. And Dickie somehow got hit with a chair shot and was bleeding like, I mean, blood everywhere. I had a white shirt on. I didn't get one drop of blood on me, but it was all on the fans, on the floor. And sometimes people got to realize, see, you got to know your audience when you do promos. And also the style of matches. Some, like Rex, his, his audience is more of the old classic WWE cartoonish kind of wrestlers. And he's got some great talent in his locker room. You got to know your audience. Fans, some wrestlers go, well, if I have this kind of a hardcore match, it's awesome. Yeah, but you just, fans get grossed out and don't want to come back. I seen one match, these two wrestlers were battling ba- at one promotion, had a barbed wire baseball bat kind of a match. They ended up hurting themselves. Kid moms were in the kitchen dodging <coughs> flying thumbtacks. Yeah. I pulled back in, people were literally getting sick in the parking lot. That's not a promo or no. a match for the fans. You and no one came back the next month. See, and that's that's the one thing I remember back when I ran you know, my promotion UBW is I try to explain to people, yeah, we can have a hardcore match here and there. But it's not going to be all the time. It has to have, to have a purpose. It has exactly. to be a, the blow off to a feud. The way to settle the situations, like the olden days with Paul Christie and Spike Huber, going through those feuds, like Huber would win, Christie would knock him out, and all of a sudden, then all of a sudden, Christie called him yellow. Well, the loser gets a yellow streak down his back. Christie loses. Huber paints the yellow streak. Yay! Christy turns around and knocks Huber out. And then also they have a saddle match. Here he is. Huber's on the saddle on Christy. Christy rears back, throws him in the tur- turnbuckle, sets up for the match for the next month. But the best thing ever done in wrestling, I have to say, classic wrestling, how they used to do it back in the day. Not planned. Spike Huber, this one girl loves Spike Huber. This is almost a stalking kind of a fan. She worked all summer to buy this beautiful jumpsuit for Spike Huber to wear to the ring. Beautiful jumpsuit. Spike Huber's down there. He presented to him in the ring. She's out there. She's beaming. Everyone's applauding. Christy comes inside the ring. Huber's down signing autographs. He doesn't see Christy. Christy jumps him and starts ripping that, that jumpsuit to shreds. Oh, no. That girl was on the ground crying in hysterical conniption fits. Half the fans wanted to kill him. Wow. That's old school. That's how they yeah. used to be back in those days. Now, I will say, for those who want to tear up autograph books, I would recommend don't do it. <laughs> because you don't know. They might have a fan, an autograph from someone that's a valuable autograph in there. Oh, yeah. So don't do that kind of stuff. I tear up signs. Yeah. One time some fan bought, bought a soda ostrich. I just stole her soda from her. Yeah, it's... There's got to be a fine line. You have to know where it is. But, you know, going back to, you know, like what I was saying about my promotion, is I made sure that certain things like that, like ladder matches, hardcore, whatever, it's got to be, like you said, it's got to be a closer for it, or it's got to be for something special. Right. It can't be all the time, every time. I preferred keeping it classic, singles, tag, whatever, and let the, let the story build itself there before you go to something elaborate. I mean, the most elaborate thing we ever did was my exile match, which... That's a long story, so we're not going to get into that with this podcast. But by all means, comment if you want to know more. Well, here's here's my question: Like, 
Yeah, is there any finishing move where you see people do that? You jump on your feet and say, "This is it," or too many people kicking out of all these moves left and right? These spot monkeys. You know, that's that's yeah, right there in a, in a nutshell. I mean, back in the day in Tennessee, you do pile driver, the whole place went off was on their feet. Oh yeah. When Jake the Snake did his DDT or Spricht, or they did the Frankensteiner, the place exploded. You, when Dusty dropped that elbow, it was over. You saw um, Slaughter put you in submission with the Cobra Clutch, I believe it was. Today we got Weeblo wrestlers. They fall down, they bounce right back up. Exactly. They, they take they a DDT, a pile driver, three or four suplexes to the table, then they jump up. I'm like, the olden days, if you did that for re- to one of those olden school guys, they would have put you in the hospital for sure. Well, not only that, but like, you know, even with their nowadays finishing moves like Cena's attitude adjustment or um, I don't know Kane's choke slam Bray Wyatt's sister Abigail's kiss they may stay down during little things here and there but over half the time they have to do two or three of them to truly end a match nowadays Mm -hmm. it's like oh my body's gotten used to it so I can just spring right back up and it's like you've lost the believability that you are this powerhouse. We look at Ronda Rousey, and you look why UWF and MMA is doing so much penalty. And I was talking, and I think, was Action Jackson, when I was visiting with Brent down, and at one time I went to Herb Simmons' promotion down there, SICW, he was saying he had a good point. Wrestlers use, like, an arm bar. These, this is a rest hole. In MMA, that's a submission hole. Uh-huh. So you guys, they look like fools doing all these moves and popping back up. In MMA, you lock someone in a hole, it's over, it's done, it's finished. Oh, yeah. Wrestling needs to get back to the basics of wrestling, not gymnastics. This ruins for high spots and flippy stuff. When the whole match is just flippy, flippy, look what I can do, stuntman gymnastics. Yeah. People get tired, but all the matches are the same. You put an arm bar, that should almost be like the end of it because they see over here Ronda Rousey puts a hold on them and they're She's, tapping out yeah. and you do the same hold and it's five minutes and they pounce back up either that makes you look like a cartoon Superman or a biggest phony under the planet yeah, exactly and, and that's something people have to realize and they've kind of gotten away from what wrestling was all about it has really gone and lost its way and you know, part of me believes that it's because kayfabe has fallen apart. It's also believed because it's just like you said, it's evolved to the point where they they do bounce off too much and everything else. I feel like if they were somehow able to make a clean slate, mm-hmm. it would be great. But I have a feeling that the fans nowadays would not allow it, and that's why we've kind of doomed ourselves. Not us, as in if you and me. We or just the need local. to re-educate the fans. One guy told me, "I won't help do promos, but kayfabe is dead." And why she teaches to do anything? You think it's dead? Exactly. It's you know, that was one thing I hated about the Stone Cold and Triple H podcast is when they all but said kayfabe is dead, and I'm like, are you really serious? That's, unfortunately, that's the biggest today's insult you could say. Well, today's wrestling, it's kind of that way. But it's like that Penn and Teller I told you about the illusion. Uh-huh. We have to go out there with the fans, and they go, well, it's fake. They're friends, and you look at. Wait a minute, these two guys aren't friends. These two are doing it for real. Yeah. They're not doing this illusion. They're not playing this match because every match you go, here's how we do a match. This would be face, face, heat, heat, shine, shine, whatever stupid formula that means. Mm-hmm. And it's like if every, if every song had the same drum beat, music would be boring. Exactly. Wrestling needs to get away from that predictable drum beat and go back to the bit. Your job is you got the fans out there. Get them into your match. Make them care. I go out there. I've been very fortunate. I've been rest. I have good people with me. I can't do it my, myself. Be good people. You work together and you set the place on fire. Promoters, I hope to God you all are listening to this because, like I said before, this man not only knows what it means to be a manager and how to cut a promo, but he knows this business and he's right on the money with this guy. Change the rhythm. He's got it right there. He could said nobody could have said better than that right now. Because every match looks the same. They all say we got all... And also, too, when you do a match and say you do everything you can do inside the match, you look what I can do. Why would they want to pay to see you again? They've already seen you do everything you can do in this match and every match you do. It's like, just go out there, the best wrestlers, and some of the guys locally are able to do that. Fill them out and just play wrestle. Yeah. Get the fans into it and just... Absolutely. And, you know... One of the best examples for the big guys is, you know, Cena because he has learned to adapt his game a little bit, change it up. And for some of the local people, I've seen actually starting to do that. You know, Derek Moss is 
starting to change his game up a little bit. I've Derek's seen... becoming one of the most popular wrestlers out there. It's insane. He's good. I think, like I said, he's talented inside the ring. But at the same time, you have to keep it believable. I know it's tempting. He's a nice guy and all. But, Derek, if you got got your opponents wanting to beat the snout out of you and the fans see it, you need to avoid them the entire card because, yeah. you know. Well, not just for Derek, but for anybody. I mean, exactly. He's not the only. Lot, I've seen a lot of people do that, and that's what kills them is because you got to be believable. You, you can't just be the superhero. When you're a face... You're always getting messed over. You're getting beat down. You're calling out the ring. You're getting up the fans up. I'm going to get my revenge. You. And you, you, your whole thing is you chasing the goal to get victory over the hill. Exactly. And you never can because the hill is a dirty, rotten coward. And the time comes and you finally get it, the place is going to go ballistic. Oh, yeah. And that... To, you know, one of the best lines I love about when the fans actually do it is the fans will go bananas. And that's exactly, exactly what you want. You don't want them to always do it because then it's just like, okay, it's rinse, lather, repeat. But you want them to always have that hope for you. I think the best way of talking about that is Daniel Bryan's whole B-plus athlete thing. Screw it over time and time and time again. You'll never make WrestleMania. You'll never make wrestling. And then what happens? He won the challenge to for the... You know the chance to become the champion. And then he overcame those odds and became the champion. And what happened? The place went nuts. The whole WWE universe went nuts. It's what truly makes the story beautiful. That was one of the best storylines they've done in a long time because it had everything going for it to make it believable. And everybody needs to do that. Not just the promoters. Not just the storyline board. It's it's all. What it really comes down to is those guys can make the perfect story. They can make the perfect layout for the card. Both the fan, the wrestlers and the managers and whoever that does the promos or the, the wrestling matches, if they don't follow through and make it where they truly believe and they can make the fans believe, your storyline's worthless. Well, another thing that helps too is a lot of these guys who put the matches together, a lot of times are the ta- out ring talent. That's your biggest mistake because you need someone who's out there who's not talent. To watch the matches and see who's getting over, who's not getting over, who what what matches. You don't want to give the fans what they want. You want to give them what they like so they'll come back and hopefully get what they want the next month. you got to have that person be on the looking glass. You have to be out there and watching, like in Dick the Bruiser's promotion, Sam Manneker, when the owners, he was out there. He was also one of the people who booked the cars. He was watching the fans' reaction. Oh, this guy's getting really good. He's got something special. We'll start promoting him. This guy here's not getting over. We need to revamp him and see how he's going. WWE, everyone, Joey Crunch's promotion is so good. Herb Simmons, Herb is out there watching the matches with Madison. Joey Grunge, he's out there. And he's got Tracy Smithers, Sierra, both watching every match out there. That's why he's such a fantastic promotion. PWA, they got people watching their matches too. That's what makes them successful. They have people actually seeing who's getting over, who's not getting over. If I go out there and I stink up the place, Joey's going to know, hey, you're stinking up the place or you really did great. And he's watching the matches, who's doing well, who's not doing well. It's better and that's when, the key. It's better when the person who's watching, like you said, mm-hmm. is not involved as a wrestler or as some type of active part like that. See, so they can almost be that fan on the sideline while still taking the notes. Now, I mean, except with Joey, since he owns a promotion, he's the owner. He's not there to get personally. He like he has his people he likes, but he's there to make money. He's not going to put oh, yeah. people up there. He's my friend. I'll keep putting him in the main event and lose money. He wants to make money. He wants to have a strong promotion. He's also going like gangbusters now. He's getting a lot of booking. So I'm saying these guys are all doing very well locally, and there's a reason why. But to keep going that way and get bigger crowds, it's the believability factor that all the wrestlers, and every card is wrestlers now. Herb Simmons, most of his guys are great. They all know what they're doing. Joey, most of his guys know what they're doing very, very well. PWA, these guys are just now starting a lot in their careers. A lot of them are learning. It's just like you got to get that fans to care to come see you perform. Mm-hmm. If it were the only match on the card, would they care about whether you win or lose? Because if you don't, if you ignore the fans, like I see one match, the guys say great, fans are looking for a reason to get involved in the match, they didn't give them a reason. They yeah. didn't, like, didn't acknowledge them, didn't look in their direction. They go back and say, hey, we had a great match. 
fans were on the feet the entire time. You didn't acknowledge them. Yeah. If I go out there and I'm going after someone and they go, eh, best guy I managed was Matt Winters. The guy had a heel persona. He knew how to work that crowd. He had a match against Brian Ely. Brian Ely. That we had so much heat when I attacked Ely at from ringside. His grandmother and then his aunt attacked me at ringside. <laughs> but instead they go, let's book him against Sage Ramsey. That's the food we want to see. I'm going, dudes, your money for you is Matt Winters and Brian Ely. As much as I've been Brian, those who had the chemistry, you could make money. Yeah. But they weren't out there to see it, so they booked Sage against Brian. And they both are great wrestlers, but they had no chemistry with their feud whatsoever. Exactly. But if he had fought Matt Winters, they could have sold a lot of tickets, but they weren't paying attention to what was getting over, and that's what turned them. Exactly. They, they lost money with that feud. And it's a shame, but that does happen a lot sometimes. But like you said, people are starting to catch on to the formula, and that's what's making a lot of the local world so incredible. And that's one reason why I love doing this podcast as well as the blog is when I do get the chance to see these local shows, mm-hmm. even not just here in Springfield, but mm-hmm. in the surrounding areas whenever I'm invited, I love it because, A, I'm a fan. B, I get to make a report about it. But C, I get to do, do like you just said, how do the fans react? As a fan, what was the pivotal moment? Was it this match or this match? Was this match where it was crickets chirping? Or were the fans reacting to the match and the wrestlers were reacting back to the fans? And that's what you want to spotlight on. And one thing is I always address, like when Crime Fighter, and I don't always agree with them, but a lot of people say, you're not a wrestler. How dare you talk about our matches? And here's like this. I go to a restaurant. I'm not a chef, am I? No. But if the food is crap, do I have a right to say it's crap? Oh, yeah. If I go to a movie and it's a real stinker, do I say... You're not a director, Ben. You have no business criticizing this movie. If you directed the movie yourself, then you need to be quiet. Anytime a fan pays money to see your car, they have every right to critique and to criticize, and the fans are right, because we're not doing wrestling cards just for our wrestlers. We're doing it for paying fans. And if they're not happy with the product, whether we think it's good or not, it doesn't matter. It sucks if the fans are buying into exactly, it. Exactly, because ultimately those fans are going to love it or hate it if they hate it they're not going to come back and then you're losing the profits if you can't take someone criticizing your match or this and that and, and some crap is taking account fans reactions but he has an opinion whether you like it or not he has every right to express it and not people like him because he's honest with them he's and, what and it's like well, with your opinions it's like I may not agree with your assessment of a certain match but that's your right to have that opinion exactly and it's that diversity. And if you and listening to all these reactions and realizing this person liked it, this person didn't like it, and you can't, you do it the best you can, but you look at the attendance. Uh, is the fans wanting to come back? If I book a card, I think it's great, and I draw 200 fans the first card, and I drew fans 100 the next card, or 50 the next card, I say, well, the weather's bad. Paul Bosch talked to a young promoter and says, you know, I had a card. 50, 40 people came up. You know why? The weather was bad. There were football games going on down the street. This was going on. No, that's nonsense. They didn't uh-huh. come because I didn't give them what they want. I was at Joey Grunge's card the same time I worked for him. And last time I worked for him, they had a basketball tournament or baseball going down the road from him, high school. He packed his place out. Oh, yeah. So it didn't matter what was going on. He gave the fans what they wanted. And they packed the place out. And that's exactly. why I'm like, even though I work for Renat, and sometimes, I, personally, I like Joey. And but the reason why these guys do well is they give the fans what they like and they promote. And, and I'm not going to be trying to sound like a jerk and sound like the authority, but sometimes the fans don't right away realize what they want. So, yeah, they may not be happy with what's going on in the card, but after the match, what happened? They're eager to see the next chapter. If you give them a reason, though, a lot of times they don't give them that reason. Well, yeah, but what I'm saying is they may not go, well, I didn't want to see this, but ultimately you did because now you're more locked in. You're more interested in that feud again than just going, oh, hey, well, he didn't get screwed over. He actually won the match, so I'm happy because that's what I wanted. No, he, he may have got screwed over. He may have had it where the referee's back was turning. He had a low blow and lost the match, but it builds that hatred for the heel to where you want to see the heel beaten so badly and you don't even realize that that's truly giving what you're, you want. I mean, it is, but sometimes you get these feuds. Feuds happen. They can't always be planned. And it's like with Winners and Ely, that feud was fine. I've seen the spark between those two and they never had capitalized on it. Some people go, well, have this feud and this guy have feud. There's no feud there. There's no chemistry. There's no hatred. 
Like, when I go out there, I have people that genuinely hate me. Oh, yeah. If I come out there, like, I'm with some guy, and I've been bad mouth eating for months, that was a golden ticket. It's like with anyone else. There's certain people that they get out there, they have a chemistry. GAW, the best feud they ever had was the Mississippi Madman versus Trek Thompson. They only ran it for three months. Nice. But their attendance went high oh, yeah. for three months. I kept that thing going for three years if I could, or a solid year, because those two drew money together. Oh, yes. But when you're not paying attention, and, and you're focusing more while well, I'm the star, and they're great guys, I'm not putting anyone down. I made my mistakes in wrestling to one, don't trust anyone wrestling, because it's like you're, you're, it's grade school politics sometimes. <laughs> But, you know, and there's great friends I've met, and my, but you got to pay attention to what's going on. Absolutely. All right, so just so we can get ready to wrap this up, I know we've actually taken over an hour time, and I well, don't want to keep you for too long. I didn't even hope I didn't hijack your podcast oh, too no, bad. No, this is great. We're you know, from Chicago. It's election year's coming up. We just run our mouths. It's <laughs> like, you know. Well, you know, and the great part about it is even though we did kind of rabbit hole around, we kind of interlaced why the promo is so important because it ties to so many other things exactly that truly matters behind the curtain and that's why i really wanted to get to the believability exactly so before we wrap this up as a person who's been a manager as a person who's ran the promos as a person who's been a fan for any wrestlers promoters managers whatever what tips would you have when it comes to the world of promos or the world of being with that microphone be genuine if you come off rehearsed now, I also volunteer the lo- local zoos as an educator, believe it or not. So, yeah, I deal with jackasses, snakes all every day of my life and wrestling and at the zoo. If you come off rehearsed, you rehearse so much, you come off rehearsed. You speak, you gotta be spontaneous. You gotta speak from the heart. Make people believe. If I walk up and say, Well, Ben, I think this is how it should go, and I can't have the big script in front of me, would this podcast be as good if I'm reading off a script? No. It's the spontaneity. That's what people are drawn to. Your promos have got to be spontaneous. You've got to be believable in what you do. Like I said, the fans think you're fake. It's your job to convince them you're not, that you're for real. What they're hearing, what they're seeing, what's going on is for real. And that's where your money's going to come from. Classic Beatles, classic Led Zeppelin, they will always sell records. Classic wrestling, the formula still work if people will give them a chance today and educate their fans. Gymnastics, and you jump down through the table, you pop back up, you're a cartoon character. No one cares when Wally Coyote gets hit with a hammer, like I said. But if you can hit something hard and you stay down, you're a human being and they care for you. Oh, yeah. and, they want to, and they want to see you come back and get your come, get the bad guy you did to you come up and that you gotta realize it's the believability on it. Wrestling is too much of a gymnastic spot fest, and I'm not saying into all the matches that way, but some of them tend to be that way. Sell, be your, be original, be yourself, be unique, give unique promos. Don't try to ape everyone else. Just be who you are. Like you get on that microphone and say, "I am such and such. I'm so and so. This is what I believe," and be and be your own character. Then you be then someone can look one day and say, "Well, he was just like Rick Body Piper. He was original. He he did something I really." And don't be afraid to experiment. The first time I came out, GCW, I had three promos to give. First one, I stunk royally. I said, "Okay, I got to do something different." Second time I came out, I was supposed to uh, this one guy, Candy Deluxe. He's now Antoine, the ring announcer for PWA. Great guy. And I was po- I went out there. I gave my orders to fire him. And I fired him. But instead of saying, you're fired, I went up to him and I just called him every name in the book. The fans got mad and wanted to kill me. It worked. One time, just said one of my best promo was that Raven won the title from Cliff. My easy money, the guy I was managing. As a commissioner, I got on the microphone. I told the referee to reverse it, but... I also do a lot of work at the state of Illinois with great, wonderful bosses. <laughs> so I just kind of aped all the bosses and wrestling and all the nice bosses I've had in the state. And I talked to them the way I've been talked to. The fans were so furious that they were beating, they were trying to beat him up in the parking lot for not punching me out for talking to him that way. <laughs> and that started a mini riot. I mean, that's when you hit the emotions, that's what you need to do. Just be genuine. 
be real. There, every guy out there locally has talent. Just starting off, you're good. But for promos, be believable. Be original. Be yourself. But you have to connect to the fans. If you do some TV skit, ignoring the camera, somebody's on their cell phone, oh, I talk to someone, what's going on? I did one of those ones. I turned around and said, hey, look, there's a camera. What do you see there for? Well, the camera's right there. <laughs> I'm not going to do a phony promo. Be genuine. If you're going to say something, don't put it on a skit and play in front of the fans during the show. Get out there in the ring and do it in the ring in front of the fans where they can react to it. Oh, yeah. Well, Donovan, thank you so much for being our guest on this. You're this welcome. An excellent time. As always, it's great to talk with you and share the It was nice seeing you again. I enjoyed your work at ringside and... Well, who knows? Maybe one day somebody will ask for me to come back out there. But if not, I'll be doing this this whole time. All right. Like I said, my next car, I believe it's in October. I think it's the 21st. It's a Saturday in Mount Plasky, Illinois. I'll be with HCCW, and I'll be managing Matt Scott and Scalpel and the great Cheyenne down there. They get some great talent down there, as you all know. Oh, yeah. And Cheyenne is probably one of the best she's, wrestlers, period. She's one of the roughest, toughest women I've ever met, and I love it. Yeah, she, she's up at the Ronda Rousey. Well, no one's really close to Ronda Rousey. She's, she's in her class of her own. She's but, a beast of her own, yeah. <laughs> but for women, for wrestlers, Cheyenne's pretty tough. Oh, yeah. So I'll hope to see fans around at the different cars. Support your local wrestling. You got Joey Grunge in Peoria. You got Herb Simmons on St. Louis. And you got PWA. He's doing a lot of cars in the central Illinois area. Support your local wrestling. Support your local wrestlers. And let them know what you feel and what you think. So, they, so if you're not happy, let them know. If you're very happy, let the wrestlers know. They always appreciate a good pat on the back as well. So Absolutely. All right, well, everybody, this is Priest. I'll see you guys in two weeks when we finish up the Behind the Curtain series. It was great having you. And, again, if you have anything you want to share or about your thoughts or comments, put it on our page. You'll be able to leave it there. And I'll be more than happy to share it with our buddy here, Donovan Taylor, because, hey, like he said, any of us, we love feedback. Thank you for listening to the Sleeper Holt Podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at thesleeperhold.com to comment on episodes, read our blog, for information about the quarterly charity, and more. See you in two weeks.